and um, welcome to the fourth in the Enterprising Impact Conversation Series. My name is Belinda Ganaway. I am part of Experience Design Agency, Fathom XP, and we are working with the IIA team at the University of Sussex, helping to bring together this entire conversation series and the associated deep dive. If this is the first time you've joined one of our lunchtime conversations, you are very, very welcome. Um, and you can also catch up on previous, the three previous conversations on our YouTube channel as well. So I'm just going to share my screen to give you a little bit more information about what we're going to do today. So today we have four speakers for you. We're going to be talking about how to understand, protect and harness the value of your research. The Enterprising Impact Conversation Series is for social science researchers and professional services teams at a number of universities, including the universities of Sussex, Bristol, Cardiff, Exeter, York and Surrey. We are very well um, populated with um, representatives of the University of Sussex and associated organisations today. Um, so that's a very exciting day for you today. Um, the, the series and the associated deep dives are all about exploring new ways to help you create greater social value from your research to build your career by supporting knowledge exchange and impact with enterprise, and also about connecting you with specialist advisors and massively importantly, helping you to identify really practical steps you can take on this journey. As I said before, you can download and, and watch all our previous conversations in the series at, on YouTube, which is the bit.ly link, bit.ly EI conversations. Sorry, e, I'm gonna give that one to you again. So the I full just, series- I put, it, I put it in the, to the chat. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. And the full series is um, uh, so the remaining, the fifth and final fifth conversation and the third and final um, deep dive are also available to sign up on that link, um, on that bit.ly link as well. So today's speakers, as I said, we are well represented by the University of Sussex and associated bodies. So we've got Keith O'Brien, intellectual property business partner um, from the University of Sussex. We've got Peter Lane, innovation support manager from the Sussex Innovation Centre. We've got Sarah Osterholzer, who's the entrepreneur in residence at the University of Sussex, and also Professor Tom Ormerod, professor of psychology at the University of Sussex. As I said, each of these sessions is really to designed to be a conversation. So we have asked each of the speakers to explore in their own way, bring drawing their own experience, a number of questions. So how do you rec how can you recognize the value of the knowledge created through your research? And I guess how might that look different for social science researchers? How can you draw on your research's value to achieve social impact and associated question, why would you? And also what business mo models might suit your research? So we will be hearing from each of the speakers in turn. We're going to kick off with Keith O'Brien. But this is a, this is these sessions are designed to be a dialogue. So do please enter into the chat to introduce yourselves, to ask questions, to say anything relevant, share any relevant experiences. And after we've heard from each of the speakers, we'll come together for a panel debate at the end where we get to explore some of your points and comments and questions and also any questions that our speakers have of each other. So I'm going to, as we said, going to kick off um, with Keith O'Brien, um, whose full title, Intellectual Property Business Partner um, in Innovation and Business Partnerships at the University of Sussex. Um, Keith is going to really look in, in depth um, for you today, looking at IP. Thank you, Belinda. I'm just going to share some slides for people to see. Can everybody see uh, the slides I'm sharing now? Yes. Excellent, thank you. Okay, just look to see the time I have. Okay, roughly 10 minutes or so. So thank you today. Nice to uh, uh, meet everyone. I'm uh, Keith O'Brien. Um, I head up the IP team at the University of Sussex. Uh, there's my contact details on the page, just in case anyone would like to ask me a question uh, after today. I'm quite willing to uh, take any questions, provide any further advice. And today I've, I've kind of um, centered my talk today, my short talk on IP in social, en in social sciences. Um, hopefully it's just gonna be really a crash course on, uh, on aspects of IP, 
hopefully you'll discover a couple of things uh, that you that you didn't know. Uh, but the main thing uh, to kind of introduce us today, I'd like to say is IP is often at the centerpiece of our work, projects, businesses or ventures, although we may not actually realize it. We produce IP at home. For example, it could be a, a cooking recipe or at work, uh, a report or a research finding. So re realizing we've produced IP that can be protected that it can be used as a tool to create a product or a service is crucial when thinking of a new enterprise or venture. So that's why today I thought I'd introduce you to some of the IP that is used particularly for social sciences. So what is intellectual property? It's basically the results of all our thoughts, ideas, activities and creations. As I said, we produce IP all the time. But actually, not a lot of us really realize it. And what can we do with it? So I've just got a list here of all the different, you know, different uh, sort of diverse nature of kind of things that you can, that is IP. And that can actually be protected. And I'll show you uh, how that can uh, be done. But it could be some, something as simple as a poem, uh, sort of an uh, artificial intelligence method, uh, any kind of product, device, a painting. All these things are RIP, and it's realizing that we can do things with these is really important. The first um, IP right, which is often at the centerpiece of sort of social enterprise sort of projects and ventures, is copyright. This essentially protects the expression of an idea. So often not the idea itself, which is which is what a patent is for. I'm not going to talk about patents today because. That they, they're not often used in social enterprise or social um, so science projects. They can be, but I'm concentrating on the ones that are copyright. So it's all to do with expression. This is an automatic right. It, you don't have to pay for it. It's just created. It, it just comes about when you create your work. Uh, and the work is just the name of the kind of things you can protect by copyright. It has to be original, as in not copied, for the, for the copyright to arise. And there are many different kinds of works that can be protected by copyright. And here I've listed a few of them, literary, musical, dramatic, artistic works, films, sound recordings. And the important thing to realize is copyright is, this is an economic right. So you can control who copies what you've done and how to disseminate it to, to the public. And I've listed here, just the, the exclusive rights basically that you get if you are the copyright owner, the author of what you've done. So you can decide sort of who can copy it, uh, who can rent it, who can sort of adapt your work. All those, those sort of rights are for you to use as you, as you would like to. And naturally, these, the copyright is very important for, in certain industries, particularly with artists, musicians, designers. And copyright is an effective right because it lasts the life of the author plus 70 years. The next right I'd like to just touch on is trademarks or brands. Whenever you um, have a new venture, it's very important to obviously think of what you can call it. Uh, and obviously trademarks, brands can be registered. So the, um, this is a definition of kind of what a trademark is. Essentially, it's any sign which can be represented to distinguish your particular sort of product service from someone else's and the trademark could be a design could be a logo could be a shape of something quite diverse really what you can actually protect as a registered trademark and to, to actually be able to register um, a trademark it needs to be distinctive and it needs to be different from an earlier trademark uh, which which may protect uh, something as the same or similar so you need a different trademark, um, uh, not protecting the same thing, or something similar. Now, the best trademarks you get are actually invented words, uh, which may seem a little unusual, but, but actually often a word that uh, doesn't describe what it is that you're doing is often more memorable and becomes actually quite um, uh, well known in itself that, you know, it, it stands out more. So, so here's some common ones that, which you'll obviously be aware of. And trademarks themselves, once they're registered, 
uh, they can be uh, they can be renewed every ten years. And obviously, if you are able to register uh, a mark, then obviously it's to prevent third parties from using the same or something similar, or um, you know the same kind of um, um, venture that you may have. Next, we have something called the design. So this is the, the, to protect the physical or aesthetic appearance of any kind of product or part of a product, not its function. That's obviously the domain of patents. So the visual features that you might protect could be anything really to do with sort of, um, you know, how the product is made up through its kind of shape, its colors, its texture, and the materials. Uh, and as long as these lead to the product being unique, that's quite important. So to, to register a design, it needs to be new and have individual character, meaning it's sufficiently different from previous designs that have been registered. And with uh, designs, you have them for registered designs, you can have them for five years, up to a maximum of 25 years. There was something um, similar called an, an unregistered design right, which is all to do with protecting the 3D aspects of, uh, of a product configuration. There's many things you can protect by designs. Uh, that's really, uh, I think, what a lot of people probably don't recognize. Then leading on to something called, well, confidential information, it's not strictly speaking an IP right, but actually is the sort of the fundamental of a lot of businesses, be they sort of, uh, you know, social enterprises or sort of profit making companies uh, that all, all ventures have information data, which will be confidential. And this could be anything um, relating to financial, business, scientific, economic information. Now, there are two types of confidential information. It could be know-how or trade secret. So know-how is, in essence, your sort of your methods, techniques for, for doing something. You know, it could be in making a product or how you perform a service. And this is not generally known to outside of your, you know, your sort of your, yourself. Um, and there's obviously normally a competitive advantage to having that knowledge. Now, it's really what a lot of us will sort of operate or trade on our know-how. That's really, really important because we can sort of make use of that through the kind of service that we that might be offered or perhaps licensing the know-how for somebody to use. The trade secret is something which is uh, a bit more than know-how, something that's perhaps a, a secrecy is generally sort of more important. There's commercial value attached to it. And obviously there's there's and normally steps taken to sort of keep the trade secret, like trades, uh, you know, secret. Uh, and in, in law, there's more protection around trade secrets. Uh, and obviously here is some common secrets that you'll probably have come across. The last uh, right that I wanted to touch upon is called a database right. Um, many people may not necessarily have come across this, but it's actually equally important particularly for collections of data, for, for, for data sets uh, that are sort of built in a systematic way. Uh, and these can be accessed through electronic or other means. Well, this can arise, you know, uh, as a database, right? So if you've built up a data set, the data itself may also be very important to actually sort of realize is there value there, but the database of the information, it has an independent sort of right that can be protected. And there's some examples here. And anybody that might sort of extract or try to use or copy a substantial part of that database without the consent of the owner will obviously uh, be in trouble for doing that. This is an automatic right like copyright, which uh, comes into place and the protection can last for 15, year 15 years. So here I'm just indicating some of the different ways you can use these IP rights. IP is intangible property, but if we look at it or compare it to tangible property or physical property, like, like a house. So uh, we all know we can buy, sell, lease, mortgage a house. We can do exactly the same things with, with IP. So we can, we can uh, sell, um, you know, we, ha we have um, copyright uh, protecting, uh, something we can actually uh, decide to sort of sell the copyright to someone, or we can actually license it, allow them to permission to sort of use it. 
or we could sort of mortgage, we could use the IP as um, security to, to obtain a loan. So these are different ways in which we can sort of use IP to sort of create uh, the, the sort of the, the substance of a kind of a, a business or a service that could be offered. And it's realizing these, these are tools which can be used in this way is really most important. And I think often we don't appreciate, we build IP and we can use it, um, these different rights together. So just the last slide, I thought I would just mention a case study, which is from the university, Interanalysis, which is a company that was formed uh, now back in 2008, which is recognized as being uh, Sussex's first social science based spin out. And this company formed from uh, academic researchers within the business school. And essentially their expertise is in relation to uh, policy uh, advice, uh, guidance, how to make uh, effective policy decisions. And this they actually sort of created into a, a company. And now here on this slide, this is some of the ways in which they've used or recognized the IP that they uh, had and have been able to sort of uh, create uh, essentially commercial venture from it. So when they, the company was established, a lot of these sort of um, IP assets were licensed into the company for the company then to sort of um, essentially sort of find a commercial way that, that these could be used and the company now operates globally. It, it, uh, it provides training courses to intergovernmental organizations, uh, to governments themselves, to actually help them in, in writing uh, trade policies, in understanding sort of, you know, how to adopt effective trade negotiating positions. So effectively, they are building a lot of sort of, um, creating a lot of social impact in what they're doing. Uh, and obviously, you just realize this, often IP and the rights, how they're used is, is basically fundamental to kind of, I think, leverage in some of the different ways that you can sort of um, make use of the kind of the, 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 the sort of the research findings, the assets that you have. So essentially that was um, my slides today and obviously happy to take any questions um, uh, at the end. Thank you so much, Keith. And um, uh, the link to the, that great case study that you just shared is also in the chat as well. Yes. So anybody who wants to, to explore that in more depth. Yeah, well, as Keith said, any questions, do add them to the chat and we'll come to them at the end when we've got a panel discussion. So thank you so much. I'm going to hand over to Peter Lane, who is the Innovation Support Manager at the Sussex Innovation Centre. Um, Peter's going to um, talk a little bit now about business models and how to start to think about the right route to market for you. Okay. Um, thank you, Keith. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. So, um, can everyone see that screen? Is that you just need to swap um, swap the display because we can just see the back end of it. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. So, um, today I'm going to talk very briefly in ten minutes uh, about um, touching on what what you're trying to achieve uh, and in exploring. Um, your investigation into business models, into commercial applications uh, or impact applications. Um, some ideas on how you discover routes forwards uh, that might recognize the value of the knowledge um, that you've created through your research. Um, I'm very briefly gonna to touch on some tools and processes that you, you might use to explore the potential of these uh, and how these might look or feel different um, within social science. Some of you may, may recognize um, this book by uh, and, and loads of videos and things that are online by Simon Sinek, which is all around um, start with the why. So as an academic, um, I think you should use your unfair advantage and your passion, your purpose and your story behind your research. Um, and just as um, Simon kind of expands on in this book, which is, is more about branding and uh, how you develop strategy, he kind of uh, talks about people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Um, and I think when you're looking at um, opportunities, starting with the why, i.e. why you're doing this, is a really powerful way of starting to engage in strategy. 
um, that drives how you move this opportunity forwards. So um, it's the problem that you're solving or have solved um, and why you're doing this that attracts value. Um, and I think this is important in developing that follow on strategy. Um, it guides all sorts of things, including who you might partner with, including um, what sort of routes that you might take forwards commercially or in impact terms. Um, so look before you leap is the first kind of um, piece of um, advice that I would share here and an insight that I would share from working on projects. So I, I think considering a wider range of applications and opportunities before you focus, um, perhaps on what you consider to be the best um, or the most suitable. Uh, and it's a fact that um, if we look at experienced innovators uh, or entrepreneurs uh, or successful academic entrepreneurs, they tend to explore um, perhaps a range of applications for their research first. Um, this doesn't mean that you have to proceed uh, with all of these, uh, but it does mean that actually you have options as a backup or potentially uh, for growth if you're successful in, in moving the first one forwards, if your first idea or if your first idea perhaps runs out of steam and you have to pivot. Uh, so rather than reach a dead end, it means that you have other options uh, that you can move to um, and adjust. And something to learn about when you move all kind of projects forwards or you engage with any kind of market application, you will find that the feedback that you get, the market feedback, the customer feedback, whatever it may be, the partner feedback will require you potentially to change. Um, so being agile um, in your approach is really important. So finding opportunity, um, this is something that you have to drive and not be driven. So different opportunities mean different playgrounds and these mean often very different rules uh, for different markets and different applications. So uh, take some time to step back um, and explore the wider opportunities, perhaps beyond uh, where you might start initially, which, which may be your own network and, and maybe past experience or contacts that you have. Um, sometimes we see that um, directions are kind of made in towards the direction of grant funding focus or maybe applications that you currently have in process. Um, Interest received through, public, uh, through your published papers, um, obviously that's extremely valuable, but again, um, you can build on that. Uh, and what we see a lot of is random approaches um, by sort of potential collaborators. And again, all these may be really valuable, they may be great, but I think you, you need to ask yourself, um, are these the right opportunities to pursue for where you are now? Um, could there be something better or, or, you know, as I put here, greener pastures out there? Um, to leverage your research knowledge and particularly the position that you're in. Um, and even if the potential seems really high, um, have you considered the specific challenges that you may need to, to overcome in order to take something forward in those different sectors? And uh, that's a key thing. Um, taking a step back to think about, you know, realistically adoption and development, um, timescale and resource needs. And do you have a detailed understanding of the market, the trends in that market, and the competition that exists within that market, so that you can, if you like, build a strategy, whether that's in partnership or otherwise. Um, and something that often is kind of last consideration is have you considered how you may see a sustainable return? And does, most importantly, that meet your ambition uh, moving forwards? Um, Something I'm a big fan of, uh, and we use a lot in the incubator um, here with obviously startup and scale up, scale up companies, as well as with our academic entrepreneurs when we're working with the university. Um, a, tool, a tools based approach is leading with the market opportunity navigator is a really great way to help you consider uh, and measure and evaluate um, the needs uh, to pursue or build a commercial outcome. But, but it's also uh, for social impact and other measures that may be important. Uh, and the Market Opportunity Navigator in particular um, can help you focus not only on the potential of different market applications, uh, but also think about some of the challenges that you might face. Um, it's, it's part of the Lean Startup Toolset, uh, which also includes the Business Model Canvas uh, as a second step and the value proposition canvas, which is often used as a third step. And the important thing is helping you take a step back to identify, uh, to think about, and to logically evaluate 
um, some of those opportunities and also to kind of then prioritize them as opportunities you're going to head forwards with based on those factors but also not just to park the other ones but to maybe put them as a backup option or as i said earlier maybe perhaps a growth option and it's designed to be simple it's designed to be iterative like all these tools uh, and it really helps in terms of bringing uh, a team together and sharing if you like your uh, your model that you're, you're um, exploring at the moment so and the, and the business model canvas uh, for those that haven't uh, experienced it yet helps you to think more broadly across the models that you're, you're looking at the customer segments the customers uh, potential partners and the value proposition uh, that you'll be looking at it, it's a great way of taking a step back and even if you think that in commercializing what i do or, or in looking at the impact of what i do uh, it's not important for me to know all these things uh, as keith said when you're looking at ip potential uh, licensing or partnerships it's really important that you understand the whole market you understand the whole model um, as opposed to just your part of it um, so we use this as a process to, to start working with new academic projects and the innovation business partnerships team at the university. Uh, and the aim for us is aiming to build a, an understanding on uh, where they are now, uh, where their ambition lies. Uh, and that helps us to uh, really understand how um, we can align support uh, or help them develop where they want to go. Um, and most importantly, I think with, with using these tools, uh, taking something forwards and exploring a business model and then taking that business model forwards is a team game um, and using tools like this allows you to engage wider skills and viewpoints um, and also if you decide to move things forwards it allows you to build and attract a team with the same why that you've got at the beginning to execute the final model itself so whether that's part of the university's team or whether you're looking to bring in other perhaps business skills or technical skills it's all really important um, so something we see quite a lot is um, this kind of question of uh, I'm doing some really, really interesting research, but I'm not sure where the applications for this might actually be. Um, I think there's, there's great news here. Um, and this is a really interesting article that um, was published in the Harvard Business Review some years ago now called The Innovator's DNA. Uh, and they uh, did a huge piece of research around uh, a lot of companies uh, and different innovators, and they, they honed down on five discovery skills that you could use uh, to distinguish uh, new ideas and develop new ideas, reveal them. Um, and the fantastic news for me is uh, I, I believe most academics have these in bucket loads. Um, so the, the skill of association, uh, I'll just run through these very quickly. Uh, I don't want to read them off the screen. Um, so, you know, connecting unrelating questions, problems, or maybe ideas from completely different fields. Uh, and I think this is really important, particularly in social sciences, where connecting knowledge, connecting skills is often the way that you can create really innovative business models, moving forwards, really innovative products or services, something unique, uh, and leveraging both IP uh, areas, perhaps. Um, observation, just look out for those small behavioral details. The two of these at the top fit really closely um, with networking uh, and we always encourage um, the academics that we work with to not only network within their own areas of skill set but also look at completely different areas where you can network with people that perhaps have much more diverse range of skills or market knowledge because if you like that catalyzes often a really interesting um, outcomes and, and ideas to move things forwards that you may not have considered before uh, experimentation um most people on this call will be much better than this than i will um scientists again like innovative entrepreneurs like to try new ideas create prototypes um perhaps in the terms of the kind of lean startup and the lean tool set develop minimum viable products or early minimum ways that they can test to see how things work um you guys are brilliant at that sort of stuff um questioning uh, and again, this is really interesting when you start working with larger companies that, that tend to just uh, execute the same business model, they execute the same products is by questioning that and by um, tearing that apart and just say, well, what, why is that? Questioning the unquestionable is, is a great way of coming up um, with new ideas, with new opportunities for innovation and, and for leveraging your research. Um, 
so as Keith talked about um, earlier, how, how might social science be different in this? Um, well, compared to a lot of um, university commercialization opportunities, your, your research is less likely to be patentable. So the business models that you develop, the market opportunities that you look like, that you, that you examine are less likely to be based around this idea of being able to license the patent as the core, perhaps, of the commercial leverage um, in, in what you do. Uh, but on the other side of that, the intellectual property that you own within your research that Keith's already run through um, is likely to leverage know-how, copyright, database rights, et cetera. So, uh, and he's talked about in the inter-analysis example, um, a fantastic way of, of kind of showing that, you know, in building a company, this is how most companies are built. Um, we're looking at uh, protecting the brand, building the brand and, and building IP in different ways. And perhaps consultancy um, can be led to uh, leverage a tool or a new process. And again, that, that allies very well with the inter-analysis example where it's a mixture of uh, a software tool that they developed and consultancy that they deliver. Um, so I think that's all I've got time to touch on. I've probably gone over by a couple of minutes. I uh, apologize for that. Um, and obviously I'll answer any questions um, at the end. I hope that's been interesting. No problem. Thank you so much, Peter. That was super interesting. And I know it's going to spark um, a lot of questions. And I know also that you're happy to share your slides. So any slides that we do have after this session, we'll contact everybody who's on the on the call today. So you'll get those via email in the next few days. So um, as I say, do have any questions um, for Peter or Keith? In fact, any of our speakers to the chat and we'll come to them at the end. And now I'm going to hand over to Sarah Osterholzer, who is an entrepreneur in residence at the University of Sussex. Um, Sarah, I think you're going to focus on social enterprise and breaking down some of the myths around that. That's exactly it. Thank you, Belinda. And thank you, yeah, Keith and Peter. Those are both really interesting sessions and great pieces of this whole puzzle. Um, so like uh, Belinda said, I'm uh, the entrepreneur in residence at Sussex. Um, and what I'd like to specifically focus on today is a different business model, um, which is social enterprise, and particularly just debunk some of the myths around it. Um, so just a bit of context, uh, I guess, of, of why I'm here as well, kind of sharing that. I um, have dedicated my career to working with early stage businesses, particularly ones who are looking at creating different business models and uh, seeing how we can have impact at the core of what they do. I um, studied uh, and got a degree in, uh, in business at Sussex Uni and then went uh, out into the world and basically kind of worked with founders as employee number one to get their ideas and bring them to life. Um, and then went more towards the business support side, uh, designed and delivered an accelerator program to help everyday people take ideas and uh, get the knowledge and structure to get the ideas off the ground. So that lean model, Peter, you mentioned, very familiar with that. Um, and then most recently, three, year, three and a half years ago, I set up my own social enterprise uh, called the Good Business Club to bring together other like-minded business owners who are doing this for the first time to help them set up businesses without having to have decades of experience behind them. So this uh, kind of 10 minute uh, session is, is very much a bite size of just top level, what are the questions we normally get asked when it comes to social enterprise um, and trying to, yeah, un unmurky the waters and give you a really clear, concise um, information to, to see if the model works for you and, and what your ambitions are as well. So. Having said that, let me share my screen with you um, and go through those bits. So, like I said, what is a social enterprise? Um, so just to set the scene a little bit um, and, and give you a sense, I guess, of, of the market and the existence of social enterprises in the UK. So this is looking um, at a report called No Going Back, uh, which was released last year by a body called Social Enterprise UK. Um, who are kind of leading uh, in the world of kind of lobbying and policy around this in the UK. So there are an estimated 100,000 social enterprises in the UK, contributing at least 60 billion to the economy, which is 3% of our GDP, um, which is three times the size of the agricultural industry. They're employing 2 million people, which is 5% of our employment here in the UK, and 34% of all early stage entrepreneurs are social entrepreneurs. So this is not a small sector. It's been growing from strength to strength. 
And if anything, having worked in the sector for nearly a decade, the last two years um, has been a massive shift um, in terms of understanding, appetite, um, and questions of, of how we can use this business model um, and make it more mainstream. Um, but surprisingly, there is no universal definition for what a social enterprise is. So um, what that leaves us with is conversations that uh, are contradictory. We're still kind of debating and getting stuck on a very simple barriers, which is just defining what they are, which is why I wanted to focus on this specifically today and uh, what I do um, day to day as well. So I've um, lent on the definitions at some other established organisations who've been doing this good work for a long time. Um, and so we've I've talked about Social Enterprise UK already. There's another organisation called Social Enterprise Mark, um, who are an accreditation uh, body to identify if you're a social enterprise. There's the Social Enterprise World Forum that happens every year, um, takes place in a different country, bringing together um, everyone who's kind of looking at this space and developing the, the industry as well as um, real world entrepreneurs as well and business owners to kind of, yeah, keep evolving what we know about this, refining it and, and getting the kind of knowledge out into the world. And also the British Council who do a lot of work both in the UK and abroad as well to support social uh, enterprises. So what I wanted to focus on to start off with um, is having reviewed those different definitions, um, look at really what is similar and what I would say is most important when we're defining social enterprises. So there's three things I wanna just unpick. So if we start with uh, the first one, which is mission focused, and this is the, the I guess the intersection um, where social enterprises uh, can meet the world of charity or kind of third sector. So social enterprises exist to tackle a social or an environmental issue, which is very much set out in their governing documents. So like a charity, they will be focused on um, a very specific uh, issue. I mean, it might be very broad, um, let's say for, say, for example, homelessness, and they exist as a model to try and tackle that. Um, that's the first kind of key defining point. Um, the second one is that their surplus is invested into their mission. Now, what that means is that um, depending on what income is coming through, once the kind of costs are covered and you've got what is either called surplus or profit left over, um, the majority of that is reinvested back into the business ultimately or into the area of impact as well. Um, and lastly, uh, that they are uh, funded by trade. So this is where I would say they are very different charitable models. Um, so charity is much more reliant on funding and donations to sustain their impact activity. Social enterprises aim to generate the majority of their operating income through trade. So they see um, the world of kind of business as a tool to do good and go actually how can we create more sustainable income specifically with you know, the world of funding um, being one dwindling and also being so um, buried in, in what you're able to do and expect. They're going actually, let's, let's use this different tool to sustain the activity you wanna do and have the impact you wanna have as well. So these are three areas that I would always say when I define what a social enterprise is. There are some things that come up um, that is where you'll basically have a lot of debate. Um, so this is where there's, there isn't consensus, right? So one is around ownership and control. Um, some of the definitions were very specific of it being uh, social enterprises having to be autonomous of the state. Others don't really mention that. Some of them say they must be independently owned, which is a bit more vague. Um, again, when we talk about how much of the profit or surplus is reinvested, um, again, some definitions specify at least 50%. Others say majority, sometimes there isn't a specific number. Um, and then finally, some definitions specify that there needs to be an asset lock. Um, so it's all about protecting um, the assets within the organization and not being able to distribute that for kind of personal gains. Um, so if you've ever had a conversation around one of these three points and you haven't um, kind of agreed upon it, uh, you're not alone in that. And I ideally would just say, don't worry too much about those elements of it. I think these three are the more important things of, you know, being set up to tackle a social issue, um, reinvesting majority of profits back into the company. And that looks at how you just 
your your kind of control and where the money goes um uh, beyond that as you develop and then also the fact that it should be really funded by trade not on a model that is sustainable on funding as well um so that's very kind of kind of top level i find it easier then to start looking at comparison to other business models so on this spectrum here for one on one side we've got the charities so like i said these exist as well to tackle a social or environmental challenge um, in society or you know that we're facing in the society and their kind of key goal is normally to eradicate something or to have a big shift and all their impact activity is uh, kind of uh, all their activities can align to that um, kind of very generally on the other side we've got more traditional business models that were set up to create um, kind of gains for shareholders um, normally at the cost of kind of people and planet. Um, I think even now that's uh, a very kind of outdated way of talking about traditional businesses, but let's just use that as an example on either side of the spectrum. Um, in the 70s, corporate social responsibility came about, and this was uh, you know, traditional businesses' ways of giving back or having impact on their local community or the kind of more general community as well. Um, and seeing how they could, yeah, contribute back into to society. Um, normally, these were um, kind of set aside budgets uh, or kind of departments that would look specifically at what good could we be doing, one of projects, that kind of thing. Social enterprise that I've talked about now kind of sits more towards the, the charitable sector. Like I said, um, I've kind of very distinguished some of the, the similarities, but also differences in those models. And what we're seeing uh, much more in the last uh, kind of five years is let's call them kind of purpose led, more ethical businesses that, um, unlike a social enterprise, aren't focused specifically on tackling a social or environmental issue, but they are um, aware and driven by the fact that they are having an impact on the world and they want that to be a positive one. So they're looking at people both internally and externally and how they could. Um, ensure a whole different kind of working experience and the impact is uh, more positive rather than negative and likewise aware of their environmental footprint and how they can change things as well. So that's how I'd say they differentiate from a social enterprise as well. Um, so I said, I think that's again, very generalistic. All those lines are still much more blurry, but I find that gives a much more clearer perspective of actually what is a social enterprise compared to other business models as well. Now, the last thing I want to just touch upon because again the first question I normally get asked um, is that one social enterprise isn't a legal structure it's a business model um, and there's no single legal structure uh, that you can use to set up a social enterprise so in case you were thinking that just want to debunk that there's a lot of different structures you can use to be a social enterprise the same way you can choose different structures to be a kind of for-profit business as well and uh, the only things I want to say on that, and I can talk more to it if anyone uh, wants to kind of go into more depth, is um, one that the UK is ahead of the game um, in terms of the whole of the, of the world. And we actually do have a legal structure specifically for social enterprises, um, which is called a community interest company, sometimes abbreviated to a CIC or a KIC. And that can be limited by shares or guarantee. Now, you don't have to be a CIC to be a social enterprise. It's just another option in the whole mix that you can choose. So again, you can choose that structure if it makes most sense for your kind of business model. But again, you can be um, incorporated by uh, other legal structures as well. Um, and ultimately, I think it's about asking yourself some questions and some considerations as well to take into account to help you choose the right structure for you. Um, so the considerations are around what the purpose is, do you want to be protected as an individual from the liability, um, and then kind of more importantly, like who will be making decisions, how will you be securing, uh, securing sorry, the majority of your initial funding, and then also where do you anticipate to get in the bulk of your income and the business model itself. When you're very early stage, a lot of this is hard to answer, um, so again, I would normally say don't worry about this and specifically choosing structures um, until you're clear and there are structures you can choose that allow you to change structures later down the line if you really want to as well. 
Um, but again, if we do a whole session just on legal structures, but I think that's important. And um, I'm happy for my slides to be shared. And this is just a table based on some of those considerations, which different legal structures you could choose um, that enable to, to, for you to do what you want to do as well. Um, I wanted to touch upon it because the key questions I get asked, but I will say not the most important thing to be thinking about. A little bit to what um, Peter was saying, I think it's more about understanding what's the need, what's the market, what's your business model going to be, and then figuring out some of these more practical sides when you're a bit clearer about that as well. Um, but I hope that uh, was enough to just kind of give you a taste of the model, debunk some of the comments that I get asked a lot. Um, and help you think about that as an option for what you guys are doing. Sarah, thank you so much for that for that great introduction. I was I was absolutely gobsmacked by those figures, feeling very very ignorant and a lot better informed. So thank you so much. And there's already some questions in the chat. If you wanted to pick up any of them in the chat, just to make sure that they get answered. If we run out of time, that would be great. But we will endeavour to come back to them and talk about them as well if we have time. So our last speaker for today um, is Professor Tom Ormerod, Professor of Psychology at the University of Sussex. Um, he's got some practical examples to share with you around developing a business plan, but will also be sort of um, responding at a more um, holistic level to our key question around the most important things researchers can do to understand, protect and harness the value of their research. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yeah, so a lot of the themes that I was going to talk about have actually been raised already. Um, so I started writing an overview and then I realised that I wouldn't have time to do anything more than just have this slide probably, so it is the talk. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is my idea that I'm developing, and I'm in the middle of doing so at the moment. So I'm sort of uh, uh, an example of an academic who's making begun that journey to, be, to being a, um, uh, someone with, who's doing knowledge exchange and entrepreneurial activity. Um, and I'll talk about a particular program that I've been involved in called the Arc Accelerator, which has been a fantastic program with one major caveat. Um, and that caveat leads to my final point, which is, why it is so really, really, really hard to, to do this kind of uh, impact and enterprise in social sciences from an academic starting point. So um, I have a background in research into um, decision making, thinking, problem solving, etc. And about 15 years ago, I met someone in a jacuzzi who asked me to do some research on um, how you could use uh, behavioural security screening to protect the, the Olympics, which led to me doing a lot of work in the aviation security uh, area. And I designed a, an aviation security screening interview, which gets used at, um, internationally now. Um, I have to say, I wish I'd had um, uh, Keith's talk on IP protection before I did that particular project, because the university I was at before Sussex, um, where I did that work, did not protect the IP at all. Um, so I've taken those things, these ideas about interviewing, particularly interviewing to tell whether people are telling the truth or not, to address a new issue, uh, which is the psychology of recruitment, um, led by things like the fact that it's estimated that between 15 and 20% of all CVs that come across a recruiting panel uh, desk have deliberate deceptions in them. Uh, that everyone does impression management. That was a starting point. And I thought my, my um, value proposition would be providing interview training to overcome that problem. But what I found when I started doing the work um, um, of the ARC Accelerator program was that actually, um, although interviewing people for jobs is a ubiquitous phenomenon, virtually no one is trained and no one knows how to do it at all. And one of the responses of large corporations has been to remove the interview from the recruitment process and to outsource a lot of their, their um, recruitment decisions to, to agencies. So I think what I realized was, as I started to work on uh, the value proposition and the business model, was that what I thought would be a relatively simple training company, basically, turns out to be much more complicated. Um, and basically, I had to start with the why that Peter um, mentioned rather than the what. Uh, I really had to work out, well, why would they need a psychologist to come in and tell them in HR departments how to do recruitment? Um, I also found that uh, from the start, 
uh, that there was virtually no psychological literature of or empirically based literature on recruitment. There are 12 stages of recruitment from needs analysis through to induction. And you can count the number of empirical studies of, of recruitment decision making on one hand. So one of the things I actually had to do to make this work was do some research. And I'm still kind of in that process. But I think it's really important to have that research base, because personally, I think one of the ways that I will protect my IP is not through legislation, but simply by being the expert. Uh, I, so I'm trying to become the expert. Um, I'm very lucky in the, um, the University of Sussex, the School of Psychology, have given me an admin job, which is basically to set this up. Um, I run a thing called the Applied Behavioral Science um, Area, and um, that's basically trying to develop psychology research as a service for non-academic organizations. So I get hours in our workload model to do that, and I can actually pursue this as part of that work. Um, so that's one resource I have. I also have a, a knowledge exchange manager, uh, Elisa Fortunato, who started work yesterday. And so um, now it's two of us developing this, not just me, which is a fantastic uh, bonus for me. About in January, I was asked to take part in a thing called the ARC Accelerator Program, which is a, a program, I think it's originally funded out of the um, ESRC, uh, where they take academics from social sciences and try and turn them into entrepreneurs, try to turn them into the sort of people who can do startup companies. It is a fantastic program. Uh, it's very, very intensive. And the big caveat is if you get invited to come on this program or you, or you want to apply to it, I think you have to get your university to agree to give you a, a term sabbatical to do it. I don't think I've got the value that I should have got out of the ARC Accelerator Programme because I've tried to do a full-time job at the same time as it. It starts off with a, a three-week boot camp where you're basically spending 15 to 20 hours a week on this. And then you have to do lots of follow-up activities. So it's really quite intensive. And I don't think I've got the everything I should have got out of it, but it has been fantastic. It picks up on quite a lot of the things that Peter talked about in terms of business model canvas, et cetera, that sort of thing. Um, and it's taken me through things like, well, what is my pitch? How to make a pitch um, uh, on, you know, what am I actually selling? What is my value proposition? Um, but more particularly, don't start by trying to sell something, start by trying to find out what people actually want. And I think that's been really, really an important part of it, because I thought that I knew what people wanted. And it's very clear that I don't. But actually, it's also clear that there are lots of different um, de uh, demands from different people in, in that sector. Um, so I haven't got a slide with the details on how to develop a pitch, but that's one of the things they taught me. And it's, and it's a very interesting process when you do that, because you're, um, you're adopting a questioning approach rather than a sales approach, if you like. Um, the business model was, was interesting also. We used a business canvas. I have got a slide just to show what that, that looks like, though I can't do the detail on it. And basically it picked up on things like, what, what are your value propositions? What are you actually trying to, to achieve? So to provide assurance to recruiters that they're appointing the right people, to reduce biases in recruitment decision-making processes. This, these value propositions were reframed after conversations with um, uh, potential um, partners, professional bodies, recruitment companies, people within the university, software development companies, that sort of thing. Um, and um, so I've worked out that essentially I have three business models and I'm still in the process of deciding which of those three to go for and, in, and if I'm going to go for them all in what order. So the simplest business model is that I provide training um, based on the psychology of, of recruitment, I provide CPD type training to companies. And that's easy to do, low investment. Um, but one of the problems is that every time I train a cohort of people, they take my IP back to their company. So ultimately what I'd like to achieve is a second business model, which is a fully integrated software service that runs a recruitment process throughout all of those 12 stages that is based on um, research and psychology recruitment. That needs venture capital investment and um, as, as a major, major piece of work to deliver that. It's a, that's a sort of million pound investment. Um, so that's a second business model, but I think I have to work that up in parallel, if only to protect some of the ideas and also to make the product more accessible and amenable to potential purchases. And the third business model actually um, speaks to Sarah's uh, talk about social enterprise 
one of the things about my interviewing methods that I've developed is that they are very good for veracity testing. And I've been approached by social workers um, saying, we would love to learn this interview technique. We have to go into houses and make decisions about whether children are vulnerable um, and their mothers, typically it is the mothers, maybe in an abusive relationship, but don't want to reveal that for fear of having their children taken away. Um, my interview methods fit that perfectly. So there's also the, the um, there's a kind of the, uh, a social responsibility angle to this work as well. And I, I, I'm still working out how to pursue all those three business models, which are kind of different, um, but all related to the same underlying product. So the business model canvas was a very, very useful pr uh, process for me indeed. Um, what that led to was this notion of the minimal viable product. What's the smallest thing that I can actually show that I've made some progress with? And that's going to be the um, continuing professional development, which will get accredited um, in interview training. And we'll start with that. Um, we went through a process of market validation. And what that essentially means is, is going out and finding potential links. They, they use LinkedIn a lot for this. I actually uh, found I didn't have time to do the kind of trawl, vast trawl through LinkedIn to make contacts. But finding people who are rep quite high up in organizations and basically talk to them about what their needs are. And so I found lots of people in HR uh, roles, people who are working in recruitment companies, people who are working uh, for um, very large corporations. And I, I spoke to them, I just had a chat and I said, listen, I'm, I've, I do research on the psychology of recruitment. How could you use that product? The products that I've got, what sort of products would you like to have if, if I were to develop them? And that really was very informative to me. Um, the process I'm going through at the moment is one of market sizing, which is if I am going to go out and try and raise venture capital, I need to be able to say, look, if you invest in this, this is the size of the market. The problem with my market is that it's huge. It's every single company. It's every single person who employs someone. It's every single person who interviews someone. It's every single person who makes a judgment about someone else's characteristics and qualities. So market sizing is, is quite tricky because on the one hand, I can be speculative and say, it's, we will have a 2 billion turnover within five years. Um, or I can be much more cautious and say, well, I think I can train about 50 people a year through CPD. So my, my market sizing sits somewhere between those two extremes. The big thing for me is actually time. I am a full-time academic. I carry out research still. I carry out, I have a full teaching load. I'm lucky that my admin is doing this. Um, and it is time that is the big, big block, I think, in this whole business of, of uh, it's not just the skills. The skills are really important and, and days like this are, are very good for sharing and acquiring them, but it's time and committing large blocks of time to do it. So I think that um, you, you need to, one of your partners needs to be your, your line manager or your head of school or whatever, because they have to buy into the fact that you will need to do this for at least half your job, really, to get it going. And I think I could stop there. Fantastic, Tom. Thank you so much. I very much didn't expect you to begin with, I met somebody in a jacuzzi. Um, but so thank you very much for taking us on all sorts of interesting directions and also coming back to the power of that business model canvas. We've probably got um, time for maybe one, two quick questions. Um, Tom, if you could stop sharing, if anybody would like to jump in or put another question in the chat. I know that Sarah and Claire have been um, mulling over a question. So if I don't get another question, I will come to that conversation. Um, Belinda, can I just ask something? Yes, something? Because obviously Tom said this is this is really, really difficult. And I, um, I think it's really important as part of this, you know, this is an open conversation. What are the different things that we can do as, uh, so I'm working, I'm an IA manager, I'm working, thinking about how to support this kind of work through, whether that's through funding or through um, capacity building, we're doing lots of work here at Sussex around that now. Um, what do we need to do to make this easier? Because um, that's uh, that's something that comes up again and again, of course, and and, and time specifically, but are there, are there other ways that this um, pursuing this way of working could be made more accessible to more people. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's there is a, a lot of the right stuff is happening at the moment. Actually, within the last year or two, I think there's been a real um, impetus in things like this, things like the 
the ARC Accelerator, which is part of a thing called the ASPECT program, which a number of universities are members of. If you Google ASPECT ARC Accelerator, you'll come up with a huge bank of um, resources. Um, I think that one thing that and I've found that they say don't give us training give us mentoring uh, we want basically to say take, take our idea and have it mentored through the process I've just got the dreaded my internet connection is unstable line so I hope I, you didn't miss too much of that but um, I think the thing I would throw into the mix is um, put mentoring alongside training Great, thank you. Do any, do any other speakers want to come back on that question? Peter, you've got your hands up. I'm sorry, you're nodding, so I'll come to yeah, you. Okay. Yes, um, for me, I think um, I take on Tom's point completely. And um, anyone that's you know investigated trying to start a company or, or you know, looking at opportunities and things, we'll, we'll reiterate that um, in bucket loads, I'm sure. Uh, I think one of the things um, that would be, would be great is starting to think about some of these things much earlier on in the research process so rather than leave it to the kind of the end if you like uh, engaging with some of these tools like business model canvas thinking about some of the market opportunities that might be out there and how you would evaluate them um, earlier in the process will help to direct um, some of these things towards um, you know more impactful um, and potential kind of commercial outcomes um, whatever business model they might be in um, so i think starting to bring that forward in the process, um, as opposed to sort of seeing it as, as something that you do at the end, uh, would would probably dilute that quite a lot and, and uh, would bring probably a lot of other benefits as well, I would imagine. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, what I would just, I guess, add to both of those two things is um, with creating anything new, like there's no need to reinvent the wheel and there's a lot of um, existing knowledge, specifically kind of models that have uh, been tried and tested. And I think for, for me, what is really valuable in, in any kind of support journey is kind of passing that knowledge down, right? So there's one thing from experts passing insights and frameworks, but also from others who've done that journey. So, but like Tom sharing today, you know, is like other people who are, who are on that journey. So how can we go to them and just go, actually, what did you learn? What would you have done differently? And just passing that knowledge down different ways. So whether it is mentoring, peer support um, with other like-minded people as well, there, there's so much that also just the osmosis of being around other people going through the same journey and all of that, that also really helps because with starting anything new, there actually isn't any really right answer. It's all a process of discovery, problem solving, and having other people to soundboard and uh, listen to is, is inspirational and means that you're also saving hopefully a lot of time rather than trying to figure it out on your own as well. Thank you so much. Keith, I don't know if you wanted to come in very briefly on that or if you think we've addressed that question sufficiently. Indeed, I think you have covered it very well. I think just really what Tom has sort of indicate, indicated is, is I think the mentorship side of this is so important and I think generally that for many universities has probably been quite a challenging thing to to provide you know particularly the resource and the capacity to do that for uh, every academic would be would be you know quite a challenge but I think it's often needed uh, for um, you know an academic project to really move forward and sort of find the sort of the commercial niche or the social enterprise niche um, it, it, it involves not just, I think training is an aspect, but mentorship, as I think Tom is really right, is really key to, to this. And I think, obviously, as you've said, Tom, the ARC has accelerated has obviously been quite a, an important um, way for that to be delivered. Can I just actually pick up on one thing? Um, Very which quickly, I, if you might. <laughs> which is, um, I think a lot of universities are still working out how to incentivize staff to do knowledge exchange. We understand impact, but we don't understand knowledge exchange. Um, I know my own university is working on how to get it effectively into promotions. One thing we're starting to think about is how to treat it as workload. And I think that until we answer these questions, we're going to be held back. I spend a lot of time trying to encourage people to do knowledge exchange, and they say, well, I've got so many other things. Where does it fit? 
Good point. Thank you so much for making that. Um, and I'm sorry we've had such a whistle-stop tour of those questions, um, but it's been a really interesting session. We've ran it over on very slightly on each, each of us because, but I think that what you've had to share has been so valuable that I, I think we've all really benefited from it. Um, we do have Richard Freeman with us, who's the CEO of always possible. Um, I know that um, there's a deep dive coming up on the University of Sussex toolkit training. Um, so uh, can I ask you just to give us a sort of a, a two minute introduction to that? And whilst you're doing that, if we're super clever, we're going to be able to launch our feedback poll for people who've joined us on this session at the same time. So you're going to be listening and also part uh, partaking in a feedback poll at the same time. So Richard, thank you so much for um, hanging on for us. We'd love to hear more about that deep dive. No problem. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. No, I'm just I'm 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 in and out quickly plugging um, something happening next week that I'd love you all to come along to and spread the word about, um, as was said. Uh, so it's on the 24th, 12 o'clock. So, um, yeah, I'm from a, I'm a, from a consultancy um, that uh, we're a collective of um, sort of business strategists, researchers, facilitators, and we've been um, delighted to work with the University of Sussex on putting a toolkit together for researchers that are trying to um, maximise the kind of value of their expertise in the commercial world, thinking about how to engage with public sector, private sector, voluntary sector, um, and sort of overcome some of the hurdles around confidence or um, language or, you know, sort of understanding a way to approach um, potential clients and, 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 and find those collaborators because we know it can be um, a real challenge. So um, we've put together what we think is a comprehensive toolkit um, and there's lots of different people that have been sort of part of putting that together, people from the corporate world, people from small business, people from the research community. Um, and we think it's a sort of uh, a, a kind of fundamentals 101 on, on, on where to start and where to get help and how to make the most of networks and how to, um, to get your expertise, kind of earning you a bit of income alongside any academic interests. So I will be doing a full hour on how to use the toolkit, what's in it, going through it section by section, and there'll be a big um, sort of lots of opportunity for questions and answers at the end. Um, and I'm happy to, for them to be tricky and, 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 and uh, you know, to, to take a grilling, that's fine. Um, but I know that copies of the toolkit are available or will be available as well, so people can, can start using it immediately. Yes, they just put a link to, the, to it in the chat. Thank I've just Mary. got it live. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Um, so yes, if that sounds remotely of interest, um, uh, you know, it'll be informal. It's a it's a conversation. It's not you know a kind of lecture. Uh, it's just a, a chance to 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 walk through this this guidebook that um, that uh, we we well, we've already had feedback is is, is really useful. So um, yeah, that, uh, that that that's me. See you next week. Thank you so much, Richard, and totally delivered in that two minute time frame. So that's amazing. And um, just to, for one more thing for me to say, thank you very much again to our speakers for a really, really rich and um, an, an informative session. And to tee up um, conversation number five, the fifth and final enterprising impact conversation, which is specifically for University of Sussex researchers this time. So it is a more of a closed session. So it's very much a, a practical step at defining your next step. So more of a surgery. You can sign up to that on the link in the chat which or just follow up search for enterprising impact conversations on eventbrite and find your way there so we are at time thank you very much indeed for joining us today and thank you once again to our speakers <laughs>